Good morning, eight o'clock devotional with the 12. So we had a very unconventional Easter, didn't we? Drive through online, we're all staying at home. And um, you know, life has changed a lot for us and we're all ready for normalization. And we may not have it the same way it was before, but with God, all things are gonna be beautiful, amen? <laughs> So, um, I'm Tina Eligio, and I'm so happy to be with you this morning. Um, we're going to be going through uh, two scriptures um, back to back. Uh, one will be opening in uh, John chapter 20, and uh, I'll be reading um, from the NASB translation. So, if you have your Bibles, open it to John 20, and I'm going to read verses. 1 through 11. And as some of you may be familiar, this is the story about the empty tomb. Uh, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. And she saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. You can hear the urgency in her voice. So Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb and he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. Wow. So when we read this, We've already celebrated how many numerous Easter's, we've heard how many different sermons, you know, different times that we ponder it on our own, in our own quiet times. But when we're reading this specific pocket of verses, man, this is happening real time to them. This is happening to Simon Peter and his disciple um, friend John. It's happening to them. When, when, when Mary went into that tomb, she didn't see it, but the stone was rolled away. Can I just say they freaked out? Do you understand that they, that they were experiencing something that must have been like electrical currents just pulsing through their body? And they were like, what is happening? Their rabbi, their precious teacher, the one that they love and they followed and lived with, he got crucified. They saw him being whipped. They saw him suffering. The one that they so love. I mean, it, it, words can't even express how dramatic and traumatic that experience was for them to witness that firsthand. So when we're reading this, you've got to, you've got to feel what they're going through. And they're going through something, I mean, you can't even imagine an empty tomb. You go to your loved one's gravesite over there at Memorial or uh, wherever your loved one's buried and there's an empty grave. There's a hole in the ground. There's no coffin. Hey, we're, we're not talking about zombie. We're talking about something like this is, this is outside of your, the parameters of your mind to conceive. It's, you're being blown away. So when they run, I mean, they're thinking, what's going on? What do you mean it's empty? They're running and they're like, they're, they're, their thoughts are just going a, a million miles per second. And they're just trying to figure this out. They're just running and, they're, and they don't know what to expect. Could this be true? There's no body in the tomb? And then when they get there, sure enough, what she said is true. The stone is rolled away. They both enter in and there's only linen wrapping. Mind blown. Are you with me? Are you there? 
Are you feeling it? Because this is what it was like to them in that pocket of time when it was happening to them, not as a recorded account on black and white paper. So I'm kind of giving you just the context of how these two gentlemen are feeling in that moment, you see? And I want to, like I said, go to another part of scripture that precedes this event, that ties in and, and factors into their emotional experience and what their thoughts are and how they're, how they're addressing this miracle. So open your Bibles uh, to Matthew 26, again, NASB version. And this is what precedes Easter, precedes the crucifixion. This is that pocket of time when Jesus had days, when he had days left with his disciples. So intense. So chapter 26, Matthew uh, verse one, when Jesus had finished all these words, he turns to his disciples. He said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the son of man is to be handed over for crucifixion. Verse three, then the chief priests and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest named Caiaphas and they plotted together to seize Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they were saying not during the festival, otherwise a riot may occur among the people. So it's kind of like verse one and two is giving you this scenario and then three and four and five is giving you kind of like, here's what's going on over here. So it's like if you're watching a movie, you see Jesus turning to his disciples and saying something very intimate. And then it's kind of like, okay, now here, here's another shot. Here's what's going on in the, in the other background event. So it's all coming together. And Jesus is being physically in one place at one time. He's also God and he sees all of this and he knows that this was, that was his mission. He was sent here to die. He knows that there's a plot to kill him. He knows he only has days left. And there's this, there's this universe, this world of thought and emotion and culminating inside of him. You know, it's, I, I don't know if we can even empathize or even begin to share or even begin to understand or grasp what that's like to have this world of emotion inside of you to know that you're the one that's gonna die for all mankind. Everyone that's ever been born, he is gonna be the one that's gonna shed his blood. That's so intense. That's so intense to think about your last days on earth. Oh, I can't even grasp what that's like. And you need to know, you need to know, friend, that that wasn't something like to Jesus. That was heavy. That was deep. And as he's sharing this, you can feel how intimate it is. He's like friend to friend, heart to heart. You know, after two days, the Passover is coming. I'm going to be handed over to die. That's what he's saying. Friends, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm fixing to die soon. <sighs> you know, that's something you would say to someone you're close to. You don't broadcast that to the multitudes that he was teaching. Something you say when you step off the stage and you tell the one that you're close to, the one that you love, how you feel. I have days to live. I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified for you. I'm going to be crucified for the whole world. And he's, he's 
it's a cry and calling for hearts to be joined to his. Do you feel that? That, that want for friendship? Oh, it's true. <clears throat> it's true. Because, read here, <clears throat> verse 6. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany, so this is all happening chronologically at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume, very expensive, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. So he's here at this dinner, and he's reclining at the table, just relax. This woman comes in, and she breaks open this expensive perfume, and she just pours it on his head. This is what the disciples say. The ones that he just got done saying, hey, I'm going to die. In a couple of days, I'm going to die. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to die for you. I'm going to die for everybody. He knew just, ooh, it's going to be, it's going to hurt. It's, I'm going to die of a broken heart. I mean, knowing all of this, he just said it. Uh, he just told him this heavy burden. So he's sitting here at this dinner. A woman comes in, breaks open this perfume. And this is what the disciples say. The disciples were indignant, mad, when they saw this. And they said, why this waste? Ugh. Why this waste? You took that, per that expensive perfume and you poured it on his head? This perfume should have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. Oh, how religious and pious. Wow, what a... What a good Christian to think like that, huh? What a good follower and disciple to think, oh, you should have took that perfume and given that money to the poor. Why are you pouring it on Jesus' head? Come on, girl. They didn't clue in to what Jesus was saying just shortly before. He was just saying, hey, you know, I'm going to die. Let that sink in. So Jesus heard all this. Verse 10. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you bother the woman? For she has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Are you, are you feeling that? He's so gentle. Even in that moment where he's like, y'all don't get it. Why are you, what you talking about? Waste. I am God in the flesh. I made you guys. I give you breath. I bless you. I'm going to die for you. What are you talking about? Waste. What are you talking about? Waste. What are you talking about? Giving to the poor. I'm, I'm, I'm about to leave this earth in the most painful way. The Bible says he died in such an excruciating way he wasn't even recognized as a human being, the Bible says. Not to mention the physical acne, but to envelop all the sin, every bad thing I've done, every bad thing all of every human being has ever done, to internalize it into his physical body. How do you contain that sin? They say, why this waste? They didn't get it. They didn't get it when he said, you know, after two days of Passover, I'm going to be crucified. But this woman got it. She got it. She recognized Jesus. She recognized him. You can go to church. You can open your Bible. You can have bumper stickers. That's all good. But you need to be like this precious woman who recognized Jesus. And that's what Jesus wants. That's what he wanted. His last days as a physical human being on earth, he 
He wanted to be with his friends and for his friends to recognize what an awesome God he is. What a good friend. What he's about to do for you. Then we're not going to have another meal together. You're not going to be able to reach out and lean on his shoulder or, you know, shake his hand or that physical thing, you know. So he honors her and he says, Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be spoken in memory of her. So precious ones, the Lord's calling out to you. You know, these, these verses in Matthew 26, it's a heart to heart. He wasn't giving a sermon. He wasn't giving a parable. He wasn't giving a prophetic declaration like Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. To preach good news. This wasn't something to chalk up for theologians to study later on in life. This was from his heart to our heart. He just wants that connection, that, that recognition, that, that thankfulness, the beauty of realizing who Jesus is. Closeness with you as a friend. So here we are in this specific moment of what they're thinking and feeling. And then you put that side by side with the empty tomb. What a dramatic thing. Do you see it? And so there's many things that we can unpack from this. And I believe one of them in parallel to what we're experiencing with this lockdown is that we no longer complain about the routine and the normal. And we don't wanna complain even about the lockdown because even this has something special in it to be with the ones in your house, to get some alone time with God. For everything else, just be still and you can know that he is Lord. Oh, he wants you to recognize how valuable the fleeting moments are. He wants you to recognize that you're sharing an experience that our precious brothers and sisters in China, believers in God, how they have to find creative ways to come together and worship the Lord. They don't have the freedoms like we're experiencing our freedoms have been taken away for the sake of health. Their freedoms are taken away because their government doesn't allow them to express their faith in Jesus. So they find creative ways. Pray for your Chinese brothers and sisters. So I hope that this has reached your heart. And let's pray together now. Okay. Lord, our world has been turned upside down like the disciples when you were taken away and crucified, and then they show up at an empty tomb. The drama of that, the intensity of that, all kind of weaves in together of, of what's going on worldwide with the intensity of these lockdowns and this threat of the virus. And I pray, Father, that we would appreciate the precious moments we have with each other because honestly, our days are numbered. And also, Lord, help us to appreciate and realize who you are, that you are the precious Lamb of God, the bestest of friends, the bestest bestie, the one who made us, the one who gives us breath. Let us pour out before you our time, our love, our devotion that's like costly perfume upon your most worthy head. And let us worship you with abandon and let us live each moment loving one another and loving you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless and stay tuned to another devotional.